Now, early on in the semester, we talked about how to heat your greenhouse and how to cool your greenhouse. And what I want to talk about now is uh, managing the temperature and how we can manage plant growth with temperature. Now, the most limiting factor in plant growth, um, or the most limiting factor most, uh, that controls photosynthesis, is either going to be temperature, light, or carbon dioxide. And you need to think about the greenhouse temperatures that are appropriate for the light and CO2 levels to maximize plant growth. And when I say the most limiting factor, whatever is limiting controls your growth. So if temperature is limiting, if it's too cold or too warm, it's going to slow growth down. If light is limiting, limiting not enough or too low, it's going to control it. CO2, same thing else. For instance, you know, if you want to go out and party this weekend, usually the limiting factor is, the most limiting factor is the one that controls whether you're going to go out. Whether it be time, that you have time to do this or not, or whether there's a place to go, if the place that you want to go is open, or if you have the money to go, which is usually the limiting factor for me, is the money. You also need to think about what's appropriate for that particular species, because not everything has the same uh, requirements. In greenhouses, we typically design our temperature profile based upon the night temperature. The night temperature. Um, the night temperature is, there's no photosynthesis, we're doing respiration, so we want to control uh, our night temperature primarily. And night temperatures, depending on the species, go anywhere from 45 to 70 degrees C. Uh, cool season plants, uh, crops like uh, carnations and uh, colder crops, uh, low night temperatures, 45, 50, 55 degrees is pretty common. Whereas you go 70 degrees is more like an African violet or something like that. So to set a regimen, we figure out what the night temperature is. And our day temperature on a cloudy day ranges anywhere between 5 and 10 degrees Fahrenheit above the night temperature. So if you have a 65 degree night temperature, your day temperature, pro, uh, which you're going to shoot for, will be um, 60 to six, uh, 55. If it's 65 degree night temperature, you're shooting for a 70 or 75 degree. On a sunny day, when you have lots of light, or if you're adding supplemental light, you're going to bump it up another 15 degrees because you're going to take advantage of that additional photosynthase. If you're injecting CO2, since you don't you want to take advantage of everything, you raise the temperature even higher. That's a good thing because we're probably going to have to close, keep the vents closed anyway to keep that CO2 in that we can allow for an extra temperature re relationship. It's important you look at the species. And this is just some examples like primula, stock, calcularia. These are cool season plants. And we have a 45 degrees. Carnations, cineraria, 50. Chrysanthemums, poinsettias, 62 to 64. And African violet, 70 to 72. So when we look at where the plants are from, like African violet, that's from the forest floor of Tanzania. Mums and poinsettias, those are um, sub-mesotropical from in this continent around uh, Mexico City. Carnations, those are higher altitude plants and so forth. Question? Um, did you say that 15 degrees on sunny days was on top of the 5 to 10? I mean, in addition no, it's not in addition to 15, 15 degrees above the night temperature. So let's back up and cover that again. That's a good <coughs> question. Okay, so we're going to set the day temperature 5 to 10 degrees higher on a cloudy day. If the sun out, 15 degrees higher than the night temperature on a sunny day. Day temperature another 5 on top of the 15. Okay. Yeah, you will do the this on top of the 5, uh, uh, 5 on top of the 15, or the 5 to 10 if you're going to inject CO2. I'm not going to inject CO2 on a cloudy day anyway because it's, it's a waste. It's a waste of uh, resources. Um, but this is not on top of this number. It's on top of the, these are all based upon temperatures. These two, uh, 5 to 10 on a cloudy day, 15 on a sunny day, are based upon increases above the night temperature. Okay. 
Does that clarify it? Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought you said Okay. Yes? Is CO2 like rise or sink in oxygen or is it just... Does CO2 rise? Oh. It stays pretty much uh, well distributed in the atmosphere. Most people will inject, when they inject CO2, like in a greenhouse tomato operation, uh, they, they're typically taking bottled CO2 or CO2 that's been stored or stripped off of the boiler. And quite often what they'll do is they'll run a tube in amongst the canopy or at the bottom of the canopy so that it gets right there with the crop. But it, it typically mixes pretty freely with the atmosphere. Question. You give a range five to ten on a cloudy day. Five to ten on a cloudy day. Depends on the crop. What about ten years? From the winter, would you set it five degrees lower because just so you don't have as much energy expenditure? I might d might swap that. Uh, uh, have a closer span in the winter time and a wider span in the summertime. Yes, but it, it, it's really species dependent. So if, you, if there's not a published data on the species that you're trying to grow, which especially in perennials, uh, quite often we don't have published data on where that is. So we want to look at, well, where did the plant come from? We can find similar species that we do have information on to we look at the native origin of the plant. Or look at the same genera, the same members of the family. Quite often that doesn't always work, yes. For books on stuff like this, the Ball Red Book is probably the best <coughs> resource for floriculture crops. The Ball Red Book. Ball Red Book. Um, when I bought my copy, there was one. It was one volume for the entire book. I think now they sell it as three volume texts, three volume books on all the data that they have. Everything from like seeding to conditions. The Ball Red Book is very complete. If it wouldn't cost you guys three hundred dollars, I would have you buy it for a textbook. Most Sorry? Mostly flowers. mostly flowers. Some veg crops, but mostly flowers. And this is all, of course, based on what's called the Q10 rule. You've seen this in plant physiology, where the temperature controls the activity of the enzymes. We raise the temperature, the enzyme activity is greater. The Q10, that means that for every 10 degrees C rise in temperature, we're getting typically a two-fold increase in enzyme activity. <coughs> if you get it too high, you can have heat stress, and heat stress is basically the denaturing of, the en denaturing of your enzymes. Think of that fried egg in the skillet. Or too low, the reaction rates are slowed down to the point where nothing is working. So it's all based upon enzymatic activity. Now we can use this in our greenhouses. Um, and I'm going to introduce you a concept called average daily temperature. The higher the average daily temperature in many crops, the faster the growth. And for instance, Easter lilies, they bloom in 42 days from visible bud at 55 degrees average daily temperature, but if we increase the average daily temperature to 65, we can cut it down to 34 days. Hydrangeas, the same thing, 112 days from start of forcing at 62, and 80 days at 72. Now this is a fine line of managing your greenhouse, okay? And we can use this specifically in Easter lilies to manage our target date of generating a crop. Question. So 65 is awesome for an Easter lily, what would be the max? Okay. Um, what happens, the max, if you get the temperature too high, especially in Easter lilies, you can have leggy growth, thin stems, small flowers, maybe delaying your flower initiation. Chrysanthemums, for instance, uh, if you get it over 85, and day, day temperature is greater than 85 degrees for chrysanthemums, actually causes something we call heat delay. It slows your crop down by exactly one week. Now, plants that are photoperiodic, it's typically uh, maybe nine, nine and a half weeks from visible bud, from flower set to bud, 
Um, in crops like Easter lilies, we use average daily temperature. You can use it to a point. Now, what is average daily temperature? That's a challenge for a lot of people to think about. When I use the word average daily temperature, what comes to your mind? Temperature average over a span of time, okay? Typically on a 24 hour period. So, how would you calculate that? Okay, how often would you measure that? On the hour is good. At a minimum. What some people think that they can do is take the maximum temperature and the minimum temperature and average that. What's that going to give you? It's going to be skewed to the high. Depending on, Depending on the day, but it's going to be skewed to the high, typically. And it's going to be an underrepresentation. So what we like for average daily temperature is at a minimum taking the temperature once an hour and actually data loggers, there are data loggers available that you could have uh, temperature measured every 30 seconds or 15 seconds if you want. That's a little bit of an overkill, but it'll give you the exact average daily temperature and you can use that to program your crop. There's also a concept called degree days. Now the degree days is something that the weather forecasters use and the weather forecasters drive me crazy pretty much of the time. But it was originally designed by heating and ventilation people and air conditioning to determine like a heating degree day to, to calculate fuel consumption. And the way it's calculated for plant growth is we use degree days and if you've had any crop science classes, um, they talk about degree days like in corn and wheat and stuff like that, to where you calculate what's called a baseline temperature. So what we do is we take um, this is the simple way to do it. Take the, the day's high and low temperatures divided by two. That's a max average. And if it's above 65, if the number's above 65, there are no heating degree days for that day. If the number's less than 65, we subtract it. And that's how, we calc that's how I, they calculate heating demand for a house. So um, this is where the numbers come from. Using heating degree days or days to flower for floriculture is where we look at days to flower based upon the average daily temperature. And you can see that it's kind of a uh, uh, sigmoidal response um, or actually a parabolic response uh, regression where your heating degree days changes, the days to flower changes based upon how we manipulate our temperature. Expanding on this a little more, hmm. so what this really boils down to is by knowing your required temperature, average daily temperature, is you can program when you want your crop to come off the bench. So if we have a target date, and this is where uh, precision of your control of your greenhouse temperature, if you have a target date of week 15, let's say, and your crop is running behind and you're measuring your crop growth, especially in Easter lilies, you're measuring how fast it's growing or unfolding rates or something like that, you can raise the temperature to meet that demand or slow the temperature, lower the temperature to slow the plant growth down. Now it comes to a point where you, using this, you need to calculate how much time and how much fuel you're spending to push that crop faster. So there comes a point where if you've got to meet a target gate, you know, if, if you're going to use more fuel than it takes, than you're going to make on that crop, then you probably have missed your scheduling date. So, so one of the fine lines of scheduling, if you go back in and look at the uh, virtual grower software, you'll see that it's all based upon um, data like this. Another thing we can do with temperature is a concept called diff. And diff stands for the difference between the night temperature and the day temperature. 
So we take the day temperature, subtract the night temperature, a negative diff, if it's less than zero, in other words, we use a cold temperature in the daytime, we can actually use that to control our plant height. One of the things that we do in floriculture crops is we, because it's in a dark greenhouse, and we, the plant is going to get too tall and leggy. So we can use diff to control the plant height. We can use positive diff to make it taller. So these are ways that we can make the plant height change without using a chemical, a chemical plant growth regulator. And this is specifically important for transplants of vegetables. Yes? What hormones does the this diff affect? What hormone does diff, what, process what processes that does diff affect? Well, I've seen data on, uh, it, it's, it's uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, actually physiological data response that I have looked at recently. Uh, it's related to calmodulin um, metabolism um, and calcium flux rates and stuff like that. Um, that's kind of what I've seen, but um, I haven't read the research in years. Um, not necessarily a gibberellin thing. Not necessarily a gibberellin thing, no. They're all interrelated, though. So if the diff is 10, we got potential for stretch is high. If the diff is 0, it's pretty much moderate. If it's negative, the potential for elongation is low. So we can use diff to keep our plants short and compact. And like I said, for those that are growing vegetable transplants, this is very important. Um, some of the side effects, if you use too much negative diff, they get chlorotic. Uh, the seedlings are stunted, of course. Um, downward curling with, with a concept called epinasty, which is actually an ethylene response. If it's really hot and you can't use diff, you know, you can't use diff all day long, some growers will use diff to minus 100 or 2, you know, really strong diff, 30, 40 degrees. But they'll do it like for 15 or 20 minutes prior to just as the sun comes up because photosynthetic activity is, activity is the greatest right when the sun comes up and if we apply the diff right there at that point when it's cold when the sun comes up that's all we need to control our plant height. A lot of plug growers do this and a lot of vegetable transplant growers do this and it eliminates the need for a, um, a crop. So this is a graphic what's called a graphical track um, and this is a, a targeting tool that we use in Easter lilies and uh, in poinsettias where we have a market window, our plant height. The plant height is actually set by our vendors. The vendors, like for instance, the big market, big box store vendors have a specific plant height for their shelf. Uh, uh, if you have a, um, a client that's, that's selling Easter lilies for churches, they want a taller plant. So you have different uh, height windows. So um, you can, this, these charts are, are published. And you look how many weeks it is to Easter. We go backwards from 14 to 0. And week 1 is actually Palm Sunday. Um, and this is between the week before Palm Sunday and Palm Sunday. This is our target delivery date for Easter lilies. So we want to maintain our, our height within here. And you can see we can use our diff temperatures to keep us within the specific target height. And you can use this for poinsettias as well and use it for diff or scheduling a plant growth regulator application. Yes? Um, back to the last slide, why, um, oh, why um, is photosynthetic activity highest at sunrise? Why is photosynthetic activity highest at sunrise? Because that's when the plant's got the most um, it's waking up, it's the stomata are opening. Um, it's like you waiting for a cup of coffee. By noon, the plant is hitting, it's, it's getting into water stress. At, at, at sunrise, the plant is fully turgid, it's taking up all as much water it's going to have. So it's just, it's just ready to go. By noon, solar noon, the plants are starting to wilt, starting to stress, and then they, the photosynthetic rate starts to deplete. Yes. <coughs> Okay, they do this with veg they use diff for vegetable transplants primarily because up until about four or five years ago there were no chemical plant growth regulators 
that were registered for use on vegetable transplants. Um, there's only, I think, Sumagic <coughs> uniconazole is the only plant growth regulator that's currently registered for uh, use on plant, uh, on so vegetable don't transplants. Don't grow too fast. Well, it keeps their plant height down and they don't grow too fast. My problem is, is I have data that shows that the memory of the plants is longer than most people think. I have data that shows that you can treat tomato seed with a uh, plant growth regulator and there's enough memory of that plant growth <coughs> regulator addition that it actually stunts the full grown plant. And so I'm kind of anti-plant growth regulator for crops that I want them, when I put them in the garden, I want them to go. Floriculture crop, where I want it to stay in the greenhouse, stay in the greenhouse, stay in the home, bloom nicely and last a long time, I fully support that. When you start putting plant growth regulators on vegetable crops, when you want to transplant to the outside, you want that plant to grow, be healthy, and kick butt. I don't want a PGR on it. The memory, uh, when you're using a natural existence like just manipulating the temperature, you're not holding up. The, the memory is, there's no memory. And a memory is a, is a very anthropomorphic term to use, but it, there's something in there that it's retained, the activity is retained. Also, by just manipulating the temperature, you can't get any more organic than this. You spray some magic on seedlings, your organic uh, window just went away. So. Is ADT over 24 hours or sunrise? 24 hours. Average daily temperature is 24 hours. Okay, so how do you use this information, things like diff and average daily temperature, use it for scheduling your crop? And uh, one of the best things to do, one of the best habits that you can ever get into is keeping a diary. Anybody keep a diary? Okay, anybody keep a diary as a teenager? No? Anybody blog? That's all it is, is a diary. Yeah. yeah. So keeping a diary um, is one of the things is that you can always do is you go back and look and see, okay, my target dates, I had my crop ready for this point, I had this insect outbreak for this point, um, and you can start predicting your crops. You can look at your cloudy weather, you can look at your rain and cold weather, because rain and cold weather influences your spring sales. Um, and typically if you have, you know, one of the worst things we can have starting now, uh, April through May, rainy weekends kill our industry. And actually what happens if we have a rainy weekend, everything's backed up in the gar greenhouses because we can't, garden centers aren't selling it, or they're backing it up, or they're backing it up. So those rainy weekends really kill us. Uh, one of the things that a garden center will do to, to fight the rainy weekends, and probably one of the best tools I've ever seen is what they call it Senior Tuesday. If you have a discount day for your seniors, they're gonna get there whether it's raining or not. They're going to get their deal, okay? And that sometimes that's a way to move product out that is stuck there over the weekend if you had a bad weekend. Um, you can manage only a couple things. You can manage how much time your crop spends in the plug tray and how much time your crop spends in a pack or in the bench. You can't manage the weather. Um, I tried yesterday and it didn't work, so. So one of the things that we look at, and I'm going to talk, this is all based on what's called a 606 pack. Do you know what a 60, the word 606 means? Let me give you some lingo of the industry. A 1020 tray is a me measured 11 inches by 21 inches. We call it a 1020 because it's close, okay? That's a standard tray. <laughs> That's a C tray. <laughs> what? Okay, we call it a 1020, but it actually measures 11 by 26. So one of the things that we can do is that tray in a 606 means I have six cell packs with six plants per cell, cell pack. Okay, six cell packs with six cells per pack. Or in a 1020 tray, we have 36 plants. Does that help? Yeah. Okay, now there's all different kinds. Yeah, a 36 pack. Well, it's got six six packs. 
which sounds like a good party. Um, <laughs> if you take, germinate those seed as seedlings and transplant them out one at a time, it's going to take you 13 weeks to generate. This is for impatience. So we have two weeks as a seedling and 11 weeks in the pack. Now, if I jump up into plug technology, is this at a specific height? This is just a saleable market or pro marketable product. Okay. An 800 plug. That means that there's 800 seedlings in that 1020 plug tray. Little bitty guys. It's going to spend about three weeks in that plug tray, but it's going to be ready in little more than. Um, right at 11 weeks. Okay. Now you notice when I have used plugs, this number doesn't change across the way. When you're just transplanting, or we call pricking out a seedling, you're breaking roots and stuff like that. Uh, it's going to cost you a, a week or so. But if you're buying your plug trays in, so the blue is before transplant, the red is after transplant. 512, 390, 288. As the numbers get smaller, the plug size gets bigger. So like for instance, the com most common one out there is, a, is probably the 288 cell pack. That's what they had at Gullies. So in other words, there's 288 seedlings per tray. Question? Are these, these are all 606 packs? These are all, okay, we're transplanting out of a plug tray into a 606. Okay. All right. So what I'm showing you here, this is we can change our time on the bench. The most expensive time on the bench is when it's in a 606 pack, because that takes up the most space. The cheapest space is when it's in these cell packs. Okay. Make sense? Or if we're not a plug grower and we're buying our plugs in, we can buy our plugs in and we can pay somebody else to grow them to this point. And we can target how long those plants sit on our bench. And this is especially important when we start looking at targeting. So if we're, if Easter is late, Easter is late and it's starting to encroach on our bench time where we want to put bedding plants in, because I can tell you that bedding plants makes about three times more money because the number of bench turns you can use on bench space than an Easter lily crop. So I want to push my time back. In other words, I'm going to push my east lilies back so far that I'm going to pull them off the bench and put them in a cooler because they keep well in the cooler. So I can start growing this. Now let me show you a little way to work this out. <coughs> okay. So you're going to use the beginning of the season. We're going to use the, s the smaller plugs or the numbers that are going to last longer. But to calculate this, I'm going to introduce you a concept called square foot week. And in this section in your handouts, there's a handout written by Healy, Bill, Will Healy when he was with Ball Horticulture where he just devised this concept we call a square foot week. It's a unit you probably never heard of. So it's based upon the standard flat. Standard flat is a 1020 tray. Now that standard flat occupies on your bench 1.69 square feet of real estate. Okay? And that b that flat sits on your bench for one week. That's called 1.69 square foot weeks. Okay? So when you start figuring out your enterprise budgets like you're doing for Dr. Hughes's class or, or for uh, Dr. Thilmany, uh, you need to think about all the fixed and variable costs that goes into supporting that production for that square foot week. Now, if you have a crop that takes five weeks to finish from transplant to moving it out of the greenhouse, Five, five times 1.69 is 8.45 square foot weeks. Make sense? 
If you have a greenhouse that's got 3,000 square feet of bench space, five weeks of production time, 3,000 times five is 15,000 square foot weeks. That's what we have in our checking account. Divide that by 8.45, because it takes 8.45 square foot weeks to finish one flat over that five weeks, we can finish 1,775 flats in five weeks. And that's how we figure out what we can put on our bench. The people that don't do this run out of bench space or don't fill their benches up. Well, you got so you got to take that 1775 and say, well, these are go all going to be the 606s after Correct. I buy. This is all assumed as the 606 and stuff like that. Of course, you can. So this you is based on flat. By mm -hmm. However many, what the 36 mm -hmm. to figure out. And so, uh, several of the seed companies, especially the ball company, you can buy a seedling book that gives you the crop time for your plug size, the species, and it tells you how many weeks it takes to finish that crop. This is all based upon a standard temperature. It's a little off topic, but where do most of these seeds come from? Where, where the most, most of the seeds are produced all over the world. Every place. Every place. Some of them are collected. Some of them, um, some of them are collected. Some of them are are, are grown. Uh, especially the F1 hybrids are typically all commercially grown. Um, so there's commercial they're seed growers. commercial seed growers. Um, some of them come. There's a lot of them in, in on the West Coast in California. Um, so there's a big operation. A couple of big operations in Costa Rica. Uh, several. Lot, they're all over the world. Is there any way to like? Absolutely. Know your supplier. They'll tell you. It's pretty misleading sometimes. I know like a lot of them are like, we're small home, blah, blah, and it's just like Monsanto and Monsanto. Exactly. We're like, oh, we're packaged in America, and then it's all over the next season. It's a challenge. You know your vendor. There's actually, I think there's a lot of good websites. OK. This is what Gully does, is what you're talking about. Yes. This is what Gully does. So when you start looking at 1,000 flats, 1,000, 10, 20 flats, 1.69 square foot for flat, this is what it costs or what it takes in square foot weeks to generate from 800 to 14, uh, 144. This is how many uh, square foot weeks it takes to generate these crops. And you can use this data to predict how much of your bench space you need to use, how much you have. Wait, wait, wait. Give me those numbers again. What's the middle one? Those are square foot weeks for... These are square foot weeks for the different species based upon their plug size. A thousand, thousand flats. So 1.69 times... So in other words, if we have a 144 tray, Six thousand seventy, so you can use this to manage. Now I'm going to show you how to calculate this in a little more detail. Stay with me a minute. All right, so I have six thousand seven hundred and sixty. I need that using a one forty four. I'm going to do a, a flat do begonias. Got a th this much greenhouse space, okay, to do a thousand flats. Thousand flats well, is what I'm looking at is square footage. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's look at our greenhouse. I have twenty five thousand three hundred fifty square foot weeks available. And this is for just a standard seedling impatience. And 15,000 square foot greenhouse, one week we have 25,350 square foot. So are we filling these up with 606s? Yeah, well this is all based on 606. It doesn't matter, this is just a, a flat. Okay. Mm. So I'm not looking at quantity per tray. Not looking at quantity per tray. 
I'm just looking at the square footage I'm occupying with a 1020 tray. So these are our planting dates. Week 9, the crop is going to be, we're going to look at growing our crop from week 9 to week 15. Week 9 is what? Um, about uh, the end of uh, February. So we're going to start week 9 and we want to harvest week 15. Then I'm going to have a second turn. This is my second turn, week 16 through 20. And a third turn, week 21 through 26. I want to turn my bench space multiple times. The more times I turn my bench space, the more money I make. Right? Mm -hmm. So we start out with turn 1. We're going to start out with 800s. We use, now this is 25,350 based upon the whole spectrum, week 9 to week 26. So I'm going to use 11,830 of my square foot weeks by using a plug size 800. That leaves me a remainder of 13,520. Think of your checkbook. Okay, this is how much, how much I got left. So go for my second turn. I'm going to switch to 390 plug size. Use 8,450 square foot weeks. 5,070. I got that le left. For my third turn, to get that turn, use my bench space efficiently. What, for instance, if I use a 390 tray again, I've overdrawn my, my bench space. At this point, if I do this, I'm putting my flats on the floor, putting my flats on the hall, putting my flats everywhere. Okay? Yes? So, I might be confused, but mm -hmm. does that mean that between weeks 9 and 15, that 13,520 square feet are not being used? Of our total picture, because this, this 25,000 is from week 9 to week 26. Okay? So I'm only occupying the bench space here, week 9 through 15, and I'm re clearing my bench space and replanting for a second turn. Okay? okay. So it's not so. No, it's not unoccupied. Okay. The whole greenhouse is full. Okay? Because okay. I'm only using six weeks here. Here I'm using six weeks. Here I'm using five weeks. You're finishing in six weeks, right? Right, you're finishing. This so you're finishing why, six why weeks. Why not after week fifteen? Technically that stuff should be cleared out, right? Right. But so why don't you have twenty five thousand available anymore? You, you don't have that much time available anymore. <laughs> so let's change our numbers a little bit. Change that to 288, and it balances. So you start playing with your plug size. Remember, the smaller the plug, bigger the number, the longer it takes to finish. So this is how we balance. This is a way to make sure that our bench space is fully uh, used during our spring months. They have programs for this, right? Why would you use a spreadsheet when you can do this like this? <laughs> It's called virtual grower. When you start really pushing into the basics, using the beyond virtual grower, beyond what you guys did in that class, that one hour of the day, if you take it and you, you go deep, deep, deep into virtual grower, you'll find this in there. But you can do this on a spread, you can write an Excel spreadsheet to do this yourself. Okay. Okay. So week 15, I'm hoping to ship those plants out so I can start on week 16. I have a really bad, I miss a ship date. I can't ship my flats of impatience from Colorado to um, southern Texas because there's a big storm. All of a sudden those flats are sitting in my space. What's happened here? Week Moved it to week 17, I put myself off. So you start monkeying with your this is where you start, this is where the weather starts making you lose sleep at night. And of course you could, finishing times for 606 flats, um, the data is out there, 
most of it's published by Ball, but all the seed com all the major seed companies generate this information. <coughs> Easter lilies, back to Easter lilies again um, for scheduling our crop production. Um, we look at our planting weeks. Of course, week 52 is uh, the last week of the year. And we usually start around week 43. These all are shif shifted based upon where we have from weeks from flower. In other words, the weeks from flower here, that's two weeks before Palm Sunday. Now with Easter lilies, We'll talk about this in floriculture class, for those of you who take floriculture class. Um, there's a couple of ways we can vernalize our crop. Who remembers what vernalization means? Cooling. Means cooling. Cooling of what? It means like you're, you're bringing down the temperature to 32 degrees below and it triggers certain... Actually, it's got to be above 32 degrees. It's got to be between 32 and 45. I call it beer temperature. And it basically yeah, triggers the plants to start uh, flowering or... What it does is it triggers the plant to, to change from a vegetative meristem to a reproductive meristem. Okay? Now it's not, you've heard the word stratification, that's breaking of dormancy. Okay? Uh, vernalization uh, doesn't happen with uh, fruit trees because the flower buds are actually formed before frost. You know, flower bud of a fruit tree is formed like in uh, uh, September, August and September. So this is actually taking a vegetative meristem, so we chill it, and the most common process, the way this all was worked out, um, was with wheat. Winter wheat, you plant it in the fall, it grows up to the boot stage, goes through the winter months, and that vernalization process converts it to a flowering meristem. Same thing in an Easter lily. So we've got two different processes. We call them case cooled, control temperature forcing, and natural cooling. Case cool means the flower bulbs are harvested. Easter lilies are the bulbs are dug for that season in um, late September. They're processed and put into a case. Case cooling means we take that case cooling and store it for 40 degrees Fahrenheit up to about um, week 48 and they would put it in the pot, put it in the greenhouse and they force it out. That's probably one of the more common ways that this is done. It's the easiest way to do it. The old fashioned way is we used to get our Easter lily bulbs shipped to us as soon as they were harvested. We pot them up and we put them into a uh, cold bed outside, carry, cover them up with straw, put uh, plastic over it and hope that it stays cold enough all winter long and doesn't freeze the pots and that it'll work pretty um, uncontrolled, hard to predict. Controlled temperature forcing is the most accurate where we take bulbs that have been newly harvested, we pot them up, we grow them for a week or two in the greenhouse, get them off and growing, and then we move the pots and the bulbs into the cooler and we cool them in the cooler at 40 degrees Fahrenheit um, up to about 15 weeks prior to um, forcing. Now of course the case, the, the control temperature forcing is the most precise, but it also means that you have to have a cooler. It also takes up the most space. It also assumes that you're going to be able to put those pots on the bench when you have poinsettias you're trying to get out of the bench. So it, you start conflicting with bench space, which is why people do the case cooling. So what this means is we can use this to use our average daily temperature to influence, was influence what we call the leaf unfolding rate. And each lily is a very precisely controlled by the leaf unfolding rate. And what the leaf unfolding rate means that um, how fast the plant is growing. And we have visible bud. Of course, this is your graphical track. Weeks for Easter. For plant height, we use diff for plant height. We use average daily temperature to produce our crop. Now, what we do with leaf unfolding rate is we start at a certain point, we try to find when we have uh, flower buds starting to form. Because Easter lilies are a determinant crop. What does determinant mean? 
at all flowers at one time, but it means that, <coughs> what's that? Lifespan. lifespan. So if an Easter, uh, which, can you think of a flower that might be indeterminate? Mm -hmm, some tomatoes, some tomatoes, yeah. Herbs. Some herbs. In other words, it constantly flowers. Mm -hmm. Determinate means once the flower buds are set, that's all the flower buds it's gonna make. So we go in there, we determine when we have flower buds, and we count the number of leaf primordia under the flower bud, and that's the number of leaves that are gonna come out before the flower bud is out, and we can calculate the number of leaves that open up. It's called a leaf unfolding rate. It takes 120 days to do leaf unfolding, and typically, especially this year, you only got about 90 days on the bench. And it's crazy because Easter falls on a different day each year. The formula for Easter in the Western Christian culture is Easter Sunday always falls on the first Sunday that follows the first full, noon, full, first full moon after the vernal equinox. In other words, it could be anywhere from March 22nd to April 25th. This year it was uh, March uh, 31st. So it was one week from being as early as it could possibly be. It's good for the bedding plant growers because it gets my Easter lilies off the bench before my bedding plant, before I need that space for the bedding plants. It puts the grower in a panic because they're starting to have to put their, start their Easter lilies before Christmas. So here's a chart of, of when you can calculate Easter. Um, most people say, well, I'll just look in the calendar. Well, you know where the calendar gets it? Well, no, they don't get it from Farmer's Almanac. They get it from determining the phase of the moon. And I know this is an old chart. Um, so for 2005, the vernal equinox was the 20th. March 25th is the first full moon. And here's some different dates. So forth. This chart actually comes from the Department of Navy. It's the, the, he, he, most of these kinds of charts are from the Naval websites. And why would the Navy be interested in this? Tide. Tide, exactly. So all this data is from the Navy. Now, Easter lilies, there's only this six, these six cultivars that are, that are used. Um, most of the cultivars in the United States are uh, Slocum's Ace and Nellie White. I have never grown anything but Nellie White. I mean, that's the most common cultivar. And you can see it takes 100 to 110 days of forcing. Um, Why wouldn't they use a harsh on the, on the lighter day? Okay. Um, why wouldn't they use the harsh? Primarily because it's, 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 not really, it's not grown by the growers that much. The um, Easter lilies, Easter lilies are uh, native to a small archipelago of islands off of Okinawa in Japan, okay? And they moved, uh, the sailors that moved, moved plants around, uh, most of the lilies, Lilium longiflorum, were grown in Bermuda. And um, it was grown in Bermuda until um, the late 1800s or so, or mid 1800s, until they had a massive virus that wiped them all out. Um, John Bartram's wife, John Bartram was a nurseryman off a long, uh, nurseryman in Florida off of Long Island, fell in love with the plant and moved them up to um, uh, the Long Island floriculture operations. And they were able to start using them for Easter. And that's, so it wasn't, use of Easter lilies as an Easter crop um, has only been around probably for a couple hundred years. It's not, doesn't go back to Christianity, the beginning is Christianity or anything. Now, most of the Easter lily bulbs prior to World War II were grown in the southern archipelago islands around Okinawa. You know, the rock forest, the rock cliffs and stuff like that. You had a question? How far back do like first greenhouses date? How hmm? Like how far back do the first greenhouses date? Like, 
they go back to um, uh, greenhouses have been commonly used uh, in agriculture since the Roman Empire. So, as documentable, there are a lot of the Incas were primarily doing. Um, they're credited with hydroponic culture, uh, but it's actually just a water culture. Yeah. So prior to World War II, most of the lilies came from um, most of the lilies came from Japan, and it was after World War I, a businessman brought a suitcase of Easter lilies home from Japan, and started planting them in uh, the Oregon area, Oregon coastal region, and before um, the enterprise started. Uh, in the 20s and 30s, where they were growing east lilies from Seattle to San Diego, okay. Now, when war, but still the prices were cheaper from Japan. Then we had this little magical thing called World War II came along, and shut down east lilies all all together, and the industry exploded. On the islands back Okinawa during World War II, the farmers were so hungry they had to eat their east lily bulbs. <laughs> Literally, okay. That's how they survived. Now, Easter lily bulb, an Easter lily will give your cat urinary tract failure, so don't get, let your cats eat it. That's not a myth. Are they fond of I'm sorry. Are they fond of no, I've had Easter lilies in my house a long time, and I've had cats for a long time. And yes. The best crop <coughs> is profitable. In Colorado to grow. Actually, um, we grow the finest plugs in Colorado than anywhere else in the United States. Plugs, plugs. seedling plugs, because we can grow our start our seedling plugs earlier and later because of our cool nights than any other place in the country. That's why we, some of our best plug growers are in Colorado: Tagawas, Welbies, uh, Gullies, such as that. Anything, all kinds of bedding plants. Pansy plugs is probably the number one money maker in the state. <laughs> legal and illegal. I know the carnation industry is legal here, but carnation industry. Carn industry carnation yeah, industry carnation. did start in Colorado, um, and it was killed by offshore production in Colombia. However, there's a fusarium outbreak in Colombia right now. They just bumped their prices up threefold. So, so actually economically competitive again? We might be actually economically competitive again, yes. I found out about the outbreak two weeks ago from one of my suppliers. Question. Um, Nothing's random from you. <laughs> Will cow lilies grow all along the West Coast? You know, yes. And actually, I've, there are growers in the state that have grown cow lilies for cut flowers here, too, as well. Mm -hmm. Are they needed? I don't remember if they're native or not. I don't remember. <laughs> I'd rather say I don't remember than lie to you. What native flowers do you know of being grown in greenhouses? What native flowers? Columbine. Columbine, yeah. Doesn't work as a good cut flower. Yeah, Columbine doesn't work as a good flower in greenhouses. Okay. So here's some. Easter forcing dates and a lily grower bases, uh, you know, if we've got early, early Easter, medium late Easter, late Easter, um, we look at the first Sunday of Lent and Palm Sunday as target dates. Um, we usually want to have visible bud by the first Sunday of Lent and we typically want to be at, move those, green, those Easter lilies out of our greenhouse the week before Palm Sunday. Um, what's an Easter lily work the day after Easter. Nothing. Seriously? They're worth nothing. <laughs> so if you've got Easter lilies sitting on the bench the day after Easter, they're not going to buy them for the um, day after. However, I have a cousin who got married the week after Easter. And her family is very Jewish and they decorated the arbor with Easter lilies and got them for a steal. <laughs> 
So emergent flower bud initiates the leaf unfolding rate. We find the terminal apex where the flower buds are. Um, use high date, use our, we want our day temperatures to work this way. Um, and we are looking at modifying our change at the time from visible bud to what we call the puffy white stage. And the puffy white stage is a technical term. Um, we want them at the puffy white stage by Palm Sunday. And we want to grow our crops in such a way. We look at our production, um, plant our bulbs deep. And when you're looking at your east village, looking at the vegetative, <coughs> the vegetative uh, meristem is going to be round and uh, spherical. The reproductive apex is going to have a little bump. And um, this is something you have to use with a, um, uh, a watch glass, a little uh, hand lens. And the leaf unfolding rate is at 53 average daily temperatures, one per day, and up to 1.8 at 69 degrees, so you modify your average daily temperature to change your leaf unfolding rate. And that's how we schedule an Easter lily. The bud meter is used to um, do your final, final uh, calculation. This was developed by Heiner Leith at UC Davis. Um, and you get your high-tech um, bud meter, go to his website, download it, cut it out with a piece of paper and laminate it, and there's your high-tech device, so. So that's got like two more days until bud dinner? Mm-hmm, yeah. When you get to this point, you're looking at pushing your average daily temperature because I had a, for, uh, I helped uh, three churches get their Easter lilies this year before Palm Sunday. I got them in on the Saturday before Palm Sunday and I could tell that they weren't close enough. So I put them in the greenhouses at Perk and I started manip manipulating the temperatures with a leaf bud meter to program them so they harvested on full. I wanted one bloom open per plant for Palm Sunday when we delivered them to the churches. So I don't know if you saw that Nick was going crazy with me doing this to him. So. Hmm? You had it dialed in there. Yeah, I had it dialed in, so. All right, I will see you all on Thursday. <laughs>